Hallo und herzlich willkommen. Hello and welcome to a new episode of History and Politics, the Kerber Stiftung's podcast on history and politics, this time again in English. My name is Gabriel Voidelko and as always, this episode deals with the question why and how history shapes the present. But hold on for a second. Today, it's slightly different and really special because we are facing a friendly takeover. I'd like to warmly welcome Katja Hoyer and Oliver Moody, who are hosting our new four-part special summer series, The New Germany. Germany after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, after the German Chancellor's proclamation of a Zeitenwende, the dawn of a new era. All the while keeping an eye on history, of course, as you are used to it from our podcast. Welcome Katja and Oliver, over to you and now let's get started. Hello and welcome to The New Germany, a special four-part series from the History and Politics podcast of the Kerber Stiftung. I'm Katja Heuer, a German historian based in Britain, and I'll be your co-pilot for this flight into the fascinating patch of turbulence that is buffeting Germany today. I'm Oliver Moody, a British journalist based in Berlin, and I'll be the annoying cabin crew member sitting at the back of the cockpit and shouting pointless instructions over the tannoy. The exits are firmly located at the rear of this podcast. Please take a few months to familiarise yourself with the safety manual for this Panzer Halbitzer 2000 bound for Kiev. Oh, come on, Oliver. At this rate, you're going to bore our listeners to death before we've even begun. Some of you may remember that we used to present the Tommies and Jerry's podcast on the history of British-German relations. But now, thanks to the Kerber Stiftung, we're taking on a more urgent topic. The tumultuous changes that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has set off in Germany at the heart of the European Union. Today, Germany is going through perhaps the most seismic period of transition it has known for 30 years, as all certainties and modi operandi are burnt away in the white heat of war on the European doorstep. In each episode of this series, The New Germany, we will peel apart an aspect of this momentous metamorphosis and set it in its proper context, speaking to some of the leading politicians and experts about the deep historical stories that help to explain how and why Germany is changing, or why it isn't. We'll talk about Russian gas, memories of the Holocaust, and Gerhard Schroeder's intimate, boozy sauna marathons of Vladimir Putin. But first, we'd like to start with one of the most remarkable and tangible shifts that this conflict has unleashed in Berlin, the path to rearmament. On the 27th of February, three days after the first Russian missiles landed on Kiev, Kharkiv and Kherson, Olaf Scholz, the German Chancellor, took the floor in the Bundestag, Germany's lower house of parliament. Only a handful of his closest allies knew what he was about to say and how it would irrevocably change the country and the balance of power in Europe. The 24. February 2022 markiert a Zeitenwende in the history of our continent. The world after the first day of this invasion, Scholz said, is no longer the same as the world before. At its heart, this is about whether power may be allowed to break law and justice, whether we permit Putin to turn the clock back into the time of the great powers of the 19th century, whether we can summon the strength to set limits on warmongers such as Putin. And as for what that strength meant in practice, Scholz said it was time for Germany to face up to... A Zeitenwende. Katja, can I just say, as a British journalist, how delighted I am to have a sexy new German compound noun to inflict on the wider world. But how do you translate it for native English speakers? In the official version, it's described as a watershed. Was well, literally a time's turn. I suppose you could call it the dawn of a new era. The bump you feel when you cross over a fold in the map into uncharted territory. Oh, all right, Bertolt Brecht. Uh, whatever you want to call it, really, the time's turn is to a certain extent real. And ever since Scholz uttered that word in the lowing of the sacrificial German calves has been heard as far as Washington and Moscow. Because those days mark three radical breaks with Germany's post-war traditions, really. First, Berlin began sending weaponry into an active theatre of conflict. Second, Scholz announced a 100 billion euro investment in hardware for the armed forces, known as the Bundeswehr. And third, Germany would spend 2% of its annual economic output on the military. And so 
Katya, at this point, I really think it's worth taking a short look at the history behind why this announcement was such a turning point in Germany's modern history. Let's start at the beginning, because I suppose it might surprise some of our non-German listeners to learn that the West German military was re-established in 1955, only 10 years after the final defeat of the Third Reich. How and why was that politically possible? Yeah, you're right. It was quite a surprise and it wasn't something that was uh, particularly palatable to, to Western powers either, but it was seen as a as a necessity. Uh, NATO was established on the 4th of, of April in 1949 as a military alliance mainly targeting Russia and the, the containment of Russian communism in Europe. And as a result of that, you ended up with West Germany, as it then was. It was established in the same year, West Germany, in 1949. And that now ended up being at the front lines, really, of the Cold War. And so as such, if there was going to be a military alliance, a defensive alliance against communism, West Germany had to be a part of that. And it's interesting as well that the first NATO Secretary General, Lord Ismay, uh, stated in 1949 that this new organization's uh, purpose was to, quote, keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. So you can see right from the beginning, there's kind of a an element uh, where Germany has to be in it, but it's it's sort of tied into it deliberately to contain its uh, sort of military ambitions and, and give it a sort of safe vehicle to, uh, to exercise those. Article 5, the, the now infamous Article 5, namely that an attack on one is an attack on all, meant that West Germany then accordingly had to rearm because uh, it's at the front lines of the Cold War and if, it, if it's part of NATO, it has to be defended by the other NATO nations and therefore it had to be a strong link in that chain. I think it was also under the strong impression really of the Korean War um, in 1950, which started in 1950, which showed the Americans and the world that this sort of cold war that was beginning to develop might well turn into a hot war um, and therefore uh, Germany needed to be sort of ready and and be part of uh, this kind of Western alliance against communism. But how then do you go about rebuilding an entire country's military from scratch? I mean, I'm surely they didn't just get the old Wehrmacht gang back together, did they? Well, you say that. <laughs> You're not completely wrong with that assertion. I mean, when it was quite surprising that when the Supreme Allied Commander, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who would later become the American president, um, declared in January 1951 that, and again, a quote here, a real difference between the a German, uh, re- sorry, between the regular German soldier and officer and Hitler and his criminal group existed. That was quite a surprise. So, you know, here's somebody who had actually taken part in the in the Second World War fighting this this very army that he's now sort of seeking to reestablish in some ways um, and is saying that actually, no, the Wehrmacht weren't all that bad. They weren't really part of of sort of Hitler and the Nazis uh, sort of criminal activities. Um, he didn't say that out of a real sense of conviction. There's a bit of a backstory to that. Namely, in October 1950, so the year after NATO was set up, the first German Chancellor, Konrad Adenauer, began to gather Wehrmacht officers together, 15 of them, at a place called Himmerod. It it was an an abbey uh, where they all basically sat together and discussed how a new uh, German army could be set up. They were deliberately supposed to be clean officers in in inverted commas. So these were people, some of whom had been involved in the uh, 1944 20th of July plot to assassinate Hitler because they were trying to find people that were basically sort of clean enough in their reputation to set up a new army. And they discussed what they could do and how they could set up a, a new army without falling back into the Wehrmacht traditions. It should be said that some of the people there were rather dubious with their background. So you had, for instance, General Furch, who was the person who came up with the oath of allegiance that the Wehrmacht swore to Hitler from, from 1934 onwards. So some people were really rather involved in Nazi ideology uh, who sat there as well. And seven of those 15 actually later joined the Bundeswehr and, and helped set it up. So the group actually said, though, that they would only be happy to set this up if there was a kind of public statement that the, as they saw it, the defamation of the Wehrmacht would stop. And both Adenauer and Eisenhower must make public statement to that effect. And it's in that context that, that Eisenhower made that statement, I said earlier. And this basically established the sort of myth of the clean Wehrmacht, the idea that, that they were just fighting for Germany as opposed to the Nazis. 
um, and weren't really <laughs> exactly weren't really involved in that at all. And then lastly, to give it the kind of complete polish in the constitution of 1956, the West German constitution, the army is deliberately set up as a parliamentary army in contrast to previous armies where they were basically first under the Kaiser's auspices and then under the under Hitler's uh, directly. And now the parliamentary army is set up so that parliament effectively sends it to war. So the commander in chief is the defense minister in peacetime, uh, the chancellor in wartime, but they can only really do stuff with parliamentary consent. And, and that's uh, supposed to be a sort of safeguard against uh, German militarism and, and ad hoc action. But how serious do you think this free armament actually ended up being? It was pretty serious. As you just said um, a few minutes ago, West Germany really was on the front line of the Cold War. And there, there, was, there was a very real fear that the Soviets could come pouring through the Fulda Gap with overwhelming conventional force at a moment's notice. So um, West Germany's armed forces were massive. Defence spending was... Briefly, over 4% of GDP, they had a standing army that was ultimately just shy of half a million soldiers. They had millions of civilians who'd had a year of military training under conscription, uh, which had been brought back in 1956. So by the fall of the Berlin Wall, they had 5,000 main battle tanks, 620 combat jets and 119 naval ships, which is three times as reunified Germany has today. The other thing that's important to mention here is that West Germans did bind them their hands by law not to acquire weapons of mass destruction. But the US stationed tactical nuclear warheads on West German soil in case an atomic war broke out. And this is um, is a sort of NATO doctrine known as uh, nuclear sharing. And still today, there are a handful of those bombs, about 15 to 20 or so, um, still there at the Buchel Air Base in, in southwest Germany. And theoretically, if a nuclear war were to break out, It would be German warplanes that delivered them to their targets. This has been hugely unpopular with the German public for for many, many years. But it's also a very uh, important symbol of America's commitment to defend its NATO allies in Europe. Yeah, absolutely. And and did that, you know, when you think that this was totally targeted at sort of Russian communism or Soviet communism, was there a change after the fall of the Berlin Wall and after the dissolution of the Soviet Empire? Oh, yes. I think if if you're being unkind, you, you, you could call it a holiday from history. The the idea was, you know, we're all surrounded by friends. We can finally um, enjoy this period when the wolf lays down with the lamb and and Europe is at peace. And everyone in NATO pretty much is is disarming to some extent at this moment because they've just been sustaining fantastically high levels of military expenditure. But Germany really goes for it. They scrap 94% of their tanks, 63% of their combat planes, 63% of their personnel. They abolish... National Service in 2011, and around the same time, there's a new doctrine about equipment that not every German military unit needs to be fully equipped. They can kind of swap the kit when they rotate in and out of overseas deployments. And when you read stories about German soldiers winding up in the Baltic winter with with no woolly underwear or, or thick socks, that is part of the reason why. Catch up, moving swiftly on. How did the German public tend to feel about their own military, but also about their involvement in NATO. Well, I think more recently, what you just said about equipment has been a, a huge problem for the reputation of the Bundeswehr. I mean, people that I know that have, have joined, they're all saying that the amount of jokes and, and sort of banter, if you want to phrase it harmlessly, that they have to endure over exactly that. You know, do you even get underwear? Um, you know, the, there was this famous story of a few years back where... Uh, the German army was reduced to using uh, painted broomsticks instead of guns, you know, in, in training exercises and things like that. It's had an effect really on the reputation of the Bundeswehr because many people are sort of looking at it as a something that isn't a kind of prestigious thing to join anymore. And I think that's caused issues with recruitment and, and all sorts of other problems. But going back a little bit further, it's astonishing really how quickly the Bundeswehr regained sort of the trust of the public. And I think that's something that despite all the problems 
remained relatively high. Most surveys that you look at across time show a sort of trust in the Bundeswehr above 70%, even, you know, irrespective of the, the problems with supplies and, and, and kind of other issues. So the trust remained high, but the reputation has suffered over the years a little bit. NATO, it depends really what political spectrum you're looking at. I mean, this this is one of the key questions, I think, at the heart of German nationhood is, is Germany really that tied to Western sort of defense and, and Western, uh, the Western world, as it were, you know, that it goes to war for it. And so if you look into the sort of left leaning political spectrum, including the, the Social Democratic Party, the SPD, uh, you will find that attitudes towards NATO have tended to be quite skeptical. This includes people like the current Chancellor Olaf Scholz himself, who when he was the, the deputy leader of the Young Socialists, the youth wing of the SPD, uh, in the early 1980s, um, referred to, to NATO as an aggressive imperialist enterprise. I mean, I'm sure he's, he's changed his opinion on that since, but it, it wasn't, he wasn't alone with that. There were a lot of people who saw the idea that Germany would go to war for sort of American uh, strategic targets and, and kind of ideas uh, as something that wasn't worth pursuing. And what kind of shape is the Bundeswehr in these days? <laughs> Don't even get me started on that. I think it's pretty dire, and I think that's been recognised with the uh, Sondervermögen, with this, this special fund that we were talking about earlier. The chief of the German army himself, Lieutenant General Alphonse Meis, said to much uh, media for raw at the beginning of the conflict with Ukraine that the Bundeswehr had been caught out by the entire conflict, really. He said it was more or less uh, blank, as he phrased it, blank. And I think a literal translation, sort of more of a direct translation, would be that the Bundeswehr was caught with its pants down by the conflict. And I think that is certainly very much the case. As you say, soldiers are stationed in Lithuania and elsewhere without suitable clothing. And, you know, when you when you take that as the tip of, of the iceberg, the cupboards were literally empty when the Ukrainian military was asking for supplies. And I think this, this has obviously been a, a problem that hasn't quite been resolved just yet. Did the Zeitenwender speech come out of nowhere then, would you say? And, and where's all of that money going now? It did and it didn't. I think it's fair to characterise the early 2010s as the, the real kind of nadir of the German military uh, when the defence budget hit a real low, but also you had changes in military doctrine that made the Bundeswehr a lot less effective. Then the Russian annexation of Crimea in 2014 was a shock. It didn't revolutionise the world by any means, but you do start to see after that this kind of creeping increase in defence spending. And I think quite strikingly and admirably, Three years after that, Germany takes charge of a NATO battle group in Lithuania, which was a pretty big step under German political standards at the time. But the level of spending we're talking about now is of a completely different order of magnitude. So of that 100 billion, we've got a pretty good idea what it's going to go on. In. 20 billion euros will just be spent on ammunition because... The general assessment is that if the Bundeswehr had to fight the kind of war that the Ukrainian armed forces are fighting now, they would have run out of ammunition in two or three days. The Air Force is going to get up to 35 American F-35 fighter jets plus 15 Euro fighters with electronic warfare capability to maintain that US nuclear deterrent um, we were talking about a while back. The Navy is going to get some new warships. They're going to be about seven armed drones from Israel, which were, which were very controversial for a long time in, in Schultz's party. And then just, you know, basic kit, things like radios that the Russians can't hack into, or night vision goggles, or, or those um, thick woolly socks for, for, for the Northern European winters. Katja, as a German citizen, does that shopping list give you any free son of discomfort? <laughs> No, but I've probably lived in Britain for too long. I mean, people are far more comfortable with the military here, you know, in terms of traditions. You see people in uniform walking around more often and, and that sort of thing. I'm, so I'm not sure how representative I am of my uh, of my fellow Germans in Germany. But I think really, as you said, it is largely, you know, things like ammunition, clothing, stuff like that. I mean, these are all things that are necessary. They aren't really, you know, it's not rearmament in the sense of, Let's go back to a, a hugely disproportionately sized army that, that is going to be a threat to the rest of Europe, but it's just making it adequate for purpose, really. <laughs> 
to discuss the recent history and indeed the present and future of the Bundeswehr. We're delighted to be joined by Rudolf Schöping, who previously served as Germany's defense minister in the first Gerhard Schröder government. Mr. Schöping, you were Germany's defense minister during a previous Zeitenwende moment, the first time the country's military was sent into active combat since the Second World War, when it joined the NATO intervention in Kosovo in 1999. What was your experience of this shift and the sometimes quite controversial political debate that surrounded it? Yeah, but on the other hand, I would not compare the present situation with what we experienced in 1999 because it is something fundamentally different. The war on the Balkans that was something regional, the Russian aggression against Ukraine that is global, it has at least a global impact. And if someone compares Kosovo, that was ethnic cleansing, that was expulsion and so on. But in Ukraine, it's something different. It's a return of great power politics, which was something like the 19th century style. And now it is a conflict basically not only between Russia and Ukraine because of the Russian aggression, but it is also something like a challenge for a stable global order with impact far beyond the territorial aspects. The principles are at stake uh, on which we built the international order in the last decades. That is, uh, for example, territorial integrity, that is national sovereignty, and so on and so on. So that is at stake, and uh, it's a conflict between old-style trade power politics on the one side and the principles and values of a global stable order on the other side. But perhaps there is one possible interesting and relevant parallel to the 1999 intervention, which is that at the time, your cabinet colleague, Joska Fischer, the Green Foreign Minister, very famously justified Germany's involvement by arguing that it had a moral duty to prevent atrocities such as Auschwitz from happening again. And to some extent, this is a debate that's happening today, whether Germany um, has a historical responsibility to prevent war or to prevent crimes against humanity. So I'd like to know how much you think the thinking in Germany about the obligations entailed by its history changed um, around the turn of the millennium, and to what extent these changes lasted and influenced the debate today. Well, Mr. Moody, first of all, that is not a contradiction. To prevent war and to prevent atrocities, crimes against humanity and so on, that is not a, a contradiction that sometimes is, let me put it this way, something like the same as we now actually see in, uh, in Ukraine. But back uh, to Joschka Fischer's remark and German historic history and the responsibility generated or created by, by this history. Yes, uh, we in Germany uh, are convinced that given the background of our history, uh, we have a maybe specific obligation uh, and a specific responsibility to contribute whatever possible to peace and freedom, not only limited to our own population or our own territory. We understand security as a comprehensive issue with various aspects. It's quite complex, but in the end, it's very clear. We, together with our European partners and within NATO alliance, are responsible to safeguard freedom and peace for all nations involved within NATO and for all others who want to cooperate with us. Herr Scharping, do you feel that in 1999 there was for the first time perhaps a realization that to safeguard peace and democracy Sometimes Germany does need to go into active combat to defend those values, which perhaps previously the understanding of that hadn't uh, perhaps quite sunk in. So to what extent was that a change and was that change durable, do you think? Did, did it last in, in the German psyche? Yes and no. It might be helpful uh, to consider what follows. Until German unification, until uh, the beginning of the 1990s, it was absolutely clear that Germany was in NATO and embedded in the European Union as uh, one of the bigger nations and economies within the European Union. 
had a quite a privileged position on the one side, protection, uh, cooperation and integration within Europe, by Europe, uh, by NATO and so on. On the other hand, it was uh, the western part of Germany was something like a front state, if you do not misunderstand me. So that was risky uh, and uh, the country was divided, which was really a pain uh, for many, many people and uh, for the nation itself. From the beginning of the 1990s, uh, I observed an intensive debate on what does it mean that a unified Germany now is uh, part of the uh, family of nations within the United Nations, is part of NATO, is leading power within the European Union. And does this change by German unification also the kind of contribution uh, Germany has to make if it comes to safeguarding peace, freedom uh, of not only their own nation, but all others and so on and so on. So what I want to say is there was an intensive debate about one decade long. How do we contribute, for example, to peace missions by the United Nations? Do we do it in blue helmet activities? Do we do it along something which is not only supporting peace, but also using military power to safeguard or to establish or to re-establish peace and so on and so on. This changed in 1999 with uh, the uh, German involvement into uh, the war because of the Kosovo. And that's the only, uh, let's say, comparison I would make with regard uh, to the actual situation emotionally. Uh, regarding the political waves and shock waves uh, running through the citizenship. Yes, that is comparable, but that's the only aspect I would compare if it comes uh, to Ukraine and uh, Kosovo uh, about 23 years ago. I think uh, Germany learned a sometimes quite painful lesson, but it learned that lesson and I observe it as uh, something like, uh, okay, it's as always in politics, it's going up and down and uh, sometimes we felt, okay, we, we earned the peace dividend uh, and we are now in the middle of peaceful continent, surrounded by friends. There is no threat, there is no challenge, there is no danger, nothing. We can develop economically, socially and so on and so on. Very nice situation, but Putin gave us a very harsh lesson that was uh, something like maybe an illusion. How would you interpret the Zeitenwende that Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor, announced in the Bundestag on February the 27th? First of all, what does it mean? And secondly, how radical is it in substance? It's very substantial. Just to give you one example, uh, Germany, one of the basic principles of German foreign and security policy was not to deliver weapons or to send armed forces into areas of conflict. That has changed fundamentally by supporting Ukraine and the Ukrainian armed forces in line with what is discussed and decided within NATO and within the European Union and with other partners. Uh, so um, I see a, a very intense uh, domestic debate, which is natural and necessary but on the other hand, it's sometimes a little bit too much focused on domestic interests or issues. So there are some in the media, some in the political arena, describing the Chancellor's attitude as clear, but the handling of the Zeitenwende is something hesitating or so. But if a political leader in this situation with a completely and fundamentally new environment, faced these challenges, is acting very considerably. Any step combined and discussed uh, with NATO members and EU members and others, that is necessary. And sometimes the domestic audience has a little bit of difficulty to accept that this very complex situation with different audiences needs to be addressed in a very careful and balanced way. I mean, arguably the Zeitenwende was necessary because of Germany's policy over the last perhaps 30 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall. When you look at defense spending alone, it used to sort of be at 3 to 4% of GDP during most of the Cold War in West Germany. 
And now Germany is struggling to reach the 2% and there's still a debate ongoing as, as to whether that's the right thing to do. So while it was quite natural for most countries to cut defence spending after the Cold War, this was done more drastically in, in Germany. Why do you think is that? So why, why, did, why was Germany so quick to abandon the idea of a sort of well-funded army? Well, earlier I um, proposed to make uh, something like a time frame uh, composed by the situation until the German unification, the 10 years until the start of the Kosovo War and the times after. If we are talking about the times after the Kosovo War, then you will see that for uh, quite some years, I would say until 2006, 2007, 2008, we had a quite acceptable, let me put it this way, acceptable spending if it comes to defense and the defense budget. Then, as said, given the feeling surrounded by friends in a stable and peaceful Europe, based on a stable and peaceful global order, a lot of people thought, okay, we do not need to spend so much. And given the concept of uh, comprehensive security, in case we are spending something to safeguard freedom and to guarantee peace and so on, then it is probably more important to spend money for development in underdeveloped countries, to fight the causes of migration and uh, many other aspects. In fact, the German defense budget declined. In uh, national terms, it is shrinking uh, down to, what was it, something like a little bit less than 1.1% of GDP, which is a completely inefficient and unsuccessful uh, way to have a strong defense and to make the necessary contributions within NATO and so on, because our security, our safety is based on uh, common efforts, common capabilities, common contributions. And one nation cannot say, okay, it's the job of the others to safeguard my peace, my freedom, my stability, and so on. So we had this decline. I thought it is completely short-sighted. And in the year 2011, Germany also decided basically not for security or other conceptual reasons, but for budget reasons, to withdraw from the draft. And the promise was, okay, we will get a lot of professional military force. We uh, do not need that draft. We do need more specialists. Uh, we will reduce the personal costs and so on. So within the shrinking of the defense budget, there is a much more substantial issue that is the shrinking of investment and uh, procurement into equipment. And this went down from about 18% of the defense budget. To say it very clearly, within a shrinking defense budget, the portion, the ratio of investment and procurement for equipment was shrinking much more from 18% of the defense budget down to a little bit less than 12% of the defense budget. That explains the situation in which the German armed forces are presently. Now, the German armed forces are underfinanced for about 10, 13 years, something in this range. And um, the special fund of 100 billion is something to change this situation, uh, I guess, in, in, in foreseeable time, but not in weeks. Uh, that will take some years. There was a fairly striking illustration of the consequences of that fiscal neglect, and especially of the lack of money available for procurement. On the morning of the Russian invasion in February, when um, Alphonse Maiz, the uh, head of the German army, published a real, you could call it a cri de coeur, I suppose, on, on LinkedIn, saying that the Bundeswehr was blank, which I, you could translate as naked or, or bankrupt, perhaps, um, and that it was barely for, capable of fulfilling its obligations to its NATO allies. Do you agree with that assessment? And, and what are the most serious problems the Bundeswehr faces today in terms of equipment and personnel? Well, it's also something conceptual thing which started in uh, 2011. 
saying, okay, the guiding principle of procurement, of investment, of military capabilities, of command and control capabilities, and so on and so on, the guiding principle is the capability to react in crises. The guiding principle until 2011 was uh, the German armed forces, the Bundeswehr, must be able to defend the territory of the Federal Republic of Germany, make sure that there could not be any uh, foreign pressure on the German government, limiting uh, the freedom of decision-making, and so on and so on. So what I want to say is, if you are looking on the numbers, that is very important, but in the end, uh, it's a little bit more necessary to look on the concepts which are creating those numbers, And within the numbers, you better look into the details to understand why the general said, uh, General Ma said, we are blank, we are naked. We are not naked in the sense to crisis reaction, as we do, for example, in the, uh, in the Baltics, something like preventive deterrence. Uh, but on the other hand, um, if it comes to limited operation in one region or limited conflict or so, if it is something more, then the Bundeswehr uh, will not be able to contribute very much per today. But this is the main decision announced by Chancellor Scholz uh, in his declaration in the German Bundestag, February 27th, to change the situation as fast and as intense as possible. And perhaps last but very important question on uh, kind of the German public's opinion and attitude towards uh, these changes and the Zeitenwende in particular. So I, I think it's fair to say that German public opinion has traditionally favored lower um, defense spending and, and there was a sort of degree of perhaps misguided pacifism involved in that in, in the wider pu public perception of what the role of the Bundeswehr and, and the role of Germany is. Do you think these attitudes are changing and, and should they change in your opinion? So the German attitude towards defense spending and perhaps the Bundeswehr on the whole. Yeah, they are changing. But first, I would like to say that between something like 2010, 2011 and uh, today, there was something like a common sense in Germany. The researchers, the scientists, the politicians, the journalists, nobody argued against this very low defense budget. Nobody argued uh, except the view against this uh, very limited uh, and shrinking military capabilities to guarantee own security and to contribute substantially to security of others within NATO and within Europe. So what I want to say is it's a little bit too simple to address this issue to, let's say, one political party or one political leader and so on. It was something like a common sense, except the few who argued that security is a long-term issue, needs long-term accountability and reliability, and also needs long-term investment to make sure that in case you need, you do not start to build up. That's the same with the firefighters and with others. Security always is a long-term effort, a long-term issue, and needs long-term and reliable, accountable lines and uh, principles of uh, decision-making. Having said this, I would say, yes, there is a fundamental change. This common sense is completely broken, in a good way broken. I mean, if you are looking in the Bundestag uh, today, there will be the decision about this 100 billion special fund. And it is a very vast majority. I just saw a recent poll uh, arguing or uh, indicating that more than uh, 60% of the German population are in favor of this uh, efforts. Uh, and supporting the principles and the guidelines uh, of the policies of our government. So, from my point of view, yes, but as after 1999, responsible political leadership, by the way, also responsible uh, scientists and journalists and so on, has to uh, contribute in a way that this long-term effort is really stable and that we are not running into the same kind of illusion after, hopefully soon, but I'm not optimistic, after the end of the war in Russia's war against Ukraine. After the end of this war will be not the same as it has been until the end of last year.
and until the uh, start of this aggression against Ukraine. Well, it will be fascinating to observe how these changes continue to unfold. And in particular, as you say, what happens once the 100 billion euros... Yeah, and we, we also have to discuss and, and, and to convince constantly uh, the electorate, the voters, the citizens, that security is something which cannot be built exclusively on military force. As said, security and foreign policy is something very comprehensive, It is complex, but it also can be translated into something which is understandable to everybody. War in Ukraine is also famine uh, in uh, Northern Africa, for example. The Chad just announced the uh, status of emergency uh, if it comes to uh, nutrition and food and so on. So we understand maybe a little bit better, a little bit more intense that this complex globe with supply chains, with globalization, with the resilience of many, many things, including the supply chains, the international work share and so on and so on. This is something like a big village, but it is a very much interconnected village in which one not only can rely on armed forces, but armed forces are a necessary, indispensable element of comprehensive security. And on that note, that's a great ending, Herr Scharping. <laughs> Thank you very much for your insight um, and sharing those with us and with our listeners. Yeah, thank you very much. And in case you have any other questions, let me know. Thank you for joining us for this very first episode of our new mini-series, The New Germany, and stay tuned for the next episode about the history and present of Germany's special relationship with Russia and the Soviet Union. You can find this and all other episodes of the Kerber Stiftung's History and Politics podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and pretty much any other app, website, or digital bazaar where podcasts can be procured. If you'd like to find out more about the Foundation or Germany's politics and history more broadly, Visit the Kerber Stiftung's website, K-O-E-R-B-E-R. -E -E no, 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 this is Umlaut Erasure. Catch ya, if you wanted umlauts in web addresses, then you should have invented the internet. The website is K-O-E-R-B-E-R-S-T-I-F-T-U-N-G.de slash E-N, or without the E-N for our German listeners. Whatever language you're listening in, it's lovely to have you with us. Goodbye, auf Wiederhören, and see you next time. Tschüss.